So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Geographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Small, and today we're talking about the Empire State Building, New York's signature landmark. And as with all the videos here on Geographics, this one is based on an original script submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That member being Ben Edelman, whose links to their socials can be found below alongside my own. And while you're down there, leave a like, comment with some feedback suggestions for future topics to cover, and subscribe if you are so inclined. I say this not at the end of the video, but the start, because analytics show the early in the video I ask people to do those three things, the more likely all three of those things are to happen. Yay. But let's get to it. When one thinks of New York City, a few things likely immediately come to mind. The Statue of Liberty, Times Square, really good pizza, and those tacky I Heart New York t-shirts. But one of the first things everybody lists is the Empire State Building. Soaring over 1,200 feet above the sidewalks of Midtown Manhattan for nearly a century now, the Empire State Building is one of the most instantly recognizable buildings in the entire world. A symbol of not just New York itself, but America as a whole. But for all that the building stands for today, culturally, it was initially constructed as a business business proposition, and one that came dangerously close to failure. It's amazing that the building was even constructed in the first place, considering that the worst economic crisis in the nation's history was ongoing while it was going up. Since then, the Empire State has endured through recessions, changes in ownership, power failures, hostile takeovers, even a plane crash. No, not that one. To become a beloved New York landmark, as well as one of the most popular tourist attractions in all of the United States. By the beginning of the 20th century, Manhattan was running out of room. The area of the island south of Central Park was quickly becoming some of the most expensive and crowded real estate in the entire country. As New York became an economic hub for all of America and eventually the world, more and more people and businesses were flooding into New York wanting to get in on the action. And they needed places to live and places to work. And fortunately for the city, new innovations in building design were allowing architects to turn the city on its end and project up into the sky itself. So for most of human history, the height of buildings was restricted by its supporting walls. The taller a building, the thicker the load-bearing walls needed to be to support it, until it reached a point where the walls were so thick that the space at the bottom couldn't be used for, well, anything. Height was also restricted by the fact that people could only be expected to climb so many flights of stairs before becoming exhausted, making taller buildings all but untenable. And there were two innovations in building technology developed in the second half of the 19th century that helped change this. These were specifically steel frame construction and the elevator, and they pretty much transformed the urban landscape. These new buildings were built with an internal framework of steel beams which held the building up while the walls were wrapped around the frame like a curtain, their only real function being to enclose the space inside, not bear the weight of the load above them. When combined with mechanically operated elevators which freed man forever from the tyranny of the staircase, there was theoretically no limit to how high a building could be. Though the first buildings to earn the name skyscrapers were built in Chicago, New York quickly became the laboratory to see just how high into the sky these things could go. The first three decades of the 1900s were a whirlwind frenzy of real estate speculation and construction as older, smaller buildings were knocked down to be replaced by buildings that were growing taller and taller each and every year. Major companies like Singer, Woolworth and MetLife were building the tallest buildings in the world, which served as huge status symbols and acted as basically free advertising for their business while also allowing them to make more money by renting out the space to other businesses who couldn't afford giant skyscraping buildings. The building boom peaked at the end of the Roaring Twenties with the race to the sky when two new skyscrapers, the Bank of Manhattan at 40 Wall Street and the Chrysler Building, went up at the same time, seemingly competing with each other for the title of world's tallest building. Automotive Baron Walter Chrysler eventually won the war in May 1930 when his building was completed, standing at a height of 1,046 feet, but the greatest of New York's skyscrapers was yet to come. And here's a little bonus fact about the Chrysler building, the design of it is copyrighted, so if you want to have it in a movie or say a video game, you have to pay whoever it is who still owns the copyright to it, which is why the Chrysler building did not appear in the latest Spider-Man game, because they didn't want to pay the licensing fee to put the Chrysler building in. Yeah, the same is true of the Hollywood sign in Hollywood, where if you want to have that in a movie or a TV show, you have to pay someone somewhere because it's copyrighted. Yeah, weird, right? Moving on. So nearby Brad and Nisha, it's time we take a break to talk about today's sponsor. And you know we're talking about today's sponsor because I'm here with our business anteater. <laughs> it's the bu Do you know what? I'm, I'm doing it now. It's business anteater. When the anteater is here, it's time for business. Business anteater. 
really funny if like each time you see it, it has like more like clothing, like you have a little hat. <laughs> just gets a little hat. A little monocle. Gets, a, gets a little suit on. <laughs> just starts standing like this in the corner of like, hmm, yes, what business are we doing today, sir? Ah, oh, but who is today's sponsor, nearby Brad and Nisha? Uh, today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. There we go. So tell me more about Skillshare, you two. Well, Skillshare is an online learning community uh, where there's thousands of online classes and members. And when you say thousands of classes, that suggests to me that there's a lot of things that you can go on there to learn about. So I'm just going to throw out some, like, you know, some broad subjects, and I want you to tell me if they have classes on that, okay? Yeah, sure. So, okay, so social media and how to post on that. Yep. Media production. Yep. Photography. Yep. Film and visual effects. Mm hmm How to catch an antique when it's thrown at you at very high speed. <laughs> Clearly not. So there's a gap in the market somewhere. Give me a batch. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? Anteaters are really scary. They're really dangerous. I was terrified right then. No, uh, because <laughs> anteaters, like this little bit here, this little bonus fact for everyone at home, like, they have one of the strongest chests in the animal kingdom because all they do basically is just tear open um, termite mounds, which are basically like organic concrete with their little claws. So they're effectively always like doing chest day whenever they walk. And they actually walk on their back knuckles like this. So they're always making tiny little fists. So it's like they're basically anti is are constantly walking around flexing on their fists like this. Yeah, but Skillshare also has courses on things that are a bit more career focused as well. So if of you course, want to yes. learn about things like freelancing, uh, entrepreneurship, that kind of thing, you can also have those courses. Nah, I'll tell you what, I need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> there was one course I was looking at where you can master editing and motion graphics in Premiere. And this was particularly interesting for me as somebody who I know a lot about Premiere, but not like how to master Premiere. Just there are so many little things when it comes to these bits of software that can make your life so much easier, improve your workflow, and just having, you know, that, that seasoned, steady hand guide you on your way can just really dramatically improve your own efficiency when it comes to, like, you know, working for yourself or just improving your skills. And one of the things I appreciate about Skillshare is that you learn by doing, because there are many ways that people can learn. And have you ever learned about the different ways people can learn? Yeah, okay, we're going to learn something about learning today. And that is that uh, I am a kinesthetic learner. I believe you can get like, you can be an audio learner or a visual learner. Essentially, kinesthetic means you learn via repetition. So like, you'll see someone do something, then you replicate that thing, and that's how you learn. And like, you know, the idea that I, I need that. And the idea of like a service that allows me to just like learn in the way where I learn best, very useful. So thank you to our sponsor, Skillshare. And right now, the first 500 people to use the link below will get one month free trial of Skillshare. John J. Raskob was not a real estate man. He'd built his fortune in business, first at the DuPont Company and then as the head of General Motors. Raskob is credited with coming up with the idea of automotive financing, allowing lower and middle class people to buy cars on credit and make instalment payments, which allowed, and I quote, every man to own his own car. He was also something of a politician, having served as the chair of a Democratic National Committee and acting as the party's campaign manager during the 1928 presidential race. The star of the Democratic Party in 1928 was New York's Governor Al Smith. Born in the city's poor Lower East Side, Smith had worked his way up from the Fulton Fish Market to the Halls of Power in Albany, serving as a champion for the forces of reform and the common man. But Smith had been badly beaten by Herbert Hoover in the presidential race and found himself replaced in the governor's chair by Franklin Roosevelt. Smith's long career in politics was suddenly over and he was at a loss for what to do next. And that's where Raskob came in. It's believed that at least part of the motivation for the construction of the Empire State Building was Raskob's desire to give his good friend Al Smith a job to do it. He was also driven by a personal and professional rivalry with Walter Chrysler. When Raskob commissioned the architectural firm of Shrev, Lamp and Harmon to design his new office building, he specifically noted that it should be taller than the Chrysler building, thereby making it the tallest building in the world. Raskob and a group of other investors formed the Empire State Building Corporation in 1929, with Al Smith serving as the president. He earned a not immodest $50,000 annual salary for serving as the frontman and chief public relations officer for the project. Meanwhile, Shreve Lamb and Harmon came up with a plan for an 85-storey building that would be exactly 
two feet higher than the Chrysler building. One thing that was missing, the Art Deco skyscrapers at the period were almost always topped by some sort of distinctive crown, like the 40 Wall Street's Copper Pyramid or the Chrysler building's Steel Spire. Men behind the Empire State Building had their own ideas for a crown, a 200 foot tall tower built as a mooring mast for non-dirigible airships to dock at and to discharge and board passengers. It was considered a revolutionary idea at the time, even if today it comes across as the kind of wacky flight of fancy we've come to expect from the Roaring Twenties. So the site chosen for the building on 5th Avenue between the 33rd and 34th streets was daring. It was in Midtown, far, far away from the towering office blocks of the financial district. The site had been occupied by the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel since 1893, one of the city's finest and largest hotels. But all the fancy people had moved uptown, so they had no real use for a big fancy hotel. So the first thing that Starrett Bros and Elton, the firm contracted to build the Empire State, had to do was demolish the old building. The replacement Waldorf Astoria would be built just a mile further north on Park Avenue, and it still stands there to this day. The developers set a target date of May 1st, 1931 for the opening of the building, giving the builders a mere 18 months to erect the world's tallest building, which <sighs> was, to quote the script, a tall order. Some said it was an impossible one, but Starrett Bros and Eakin were the best in the business, renowned for their speed and craftsmanship. Demolition of the Waldorf Astoria began on October 1st, 1929, followed by digging and pouring of the foundations. Construction of the building itself began in March 1930 by erecting the steel framework that was the integral skeleton of the structure. The steel beams were forged in foundry in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, then shipped to New York and trucked through midtown traffic to the building, where it was hoisted into place by lifts built in the hollow core of the building where the elevator shafts would go. They were bolted into place by rivet gangs and if anyone wondering what is a rivet gang well they were actually really awesome so a rivet gang consisted of several men and it'd be one man would heat the rivet on a portable furnace until it was red hot and he would literally toss it distances of up to 75 feet to another man who would catch it in a funneled can to be hammered into place by the man with the rivet gun. The four-man rivet gangs developed such a degree of trust amongst themselves that when one man didn't show up for work, none of them would go to work that day. The iron workers went skywards at a, let's be honest, blistering pace by today's standards, while on the already completed lower floors, other workers would put together the rest of the building. An army of over 3,000 workers from 60 different trades swarmed all over the site from 8am to 4 30 p.m. with a half hour lunch break. So efficient was the pace of construction that almost no overtime was needed to be put in to finish the building by April 11th, 1931, 30 months after the beginning of construction. It was a feat that amazed pretty much the entire country and one that is unlikely to ever come close to happening again. The grand opening of the building on May 1st, 1931 was a gala event, broadcast live on radio all over the country. The star attraction was, of course, the outdoor observation deck on the 86th floor, where you could pay $1 a head, today it's around $44, for a view that took people's breath away. All of New York laid out before you like a carpet, people and cars looking no bigger than ants. For a culture where only the rich and the brave could fly, it was a view that you couldn't get anywhere else in the world. The observatory quickly became one of the city's most popular attractions, outdrawing the Statue of Liberty and observation decks on other, lesser, shorter buildings. It became an essential stop for anyone visiting the city, whether they were a sailor enjoying half-price admission during Fleet Week or a VIP awarded a personal tour by Al Smith himself. Souvenirs, including postcards and scale models of the building that doubled as paperweights and pencil sharpeners were must-have items. More than that, however, the Empire estate quickly became a cultural icon, an instantly recognisable symbol of New York and America itself. As the world's tallest building, it was regularly featured in advertising for products ranging from shirts to pencils, camel cigarettes to Kellogg's Rice Krispies. The first and most famous movie to feature the building was 1933's King Kong, where the titular giant ape climbs to the top of the building, screaming blonde hostage in tow before being shot off by a squadron of fighter planes in the film's climax. The Empire State Building was also a key player in the romantic dramas and affair to remember in 1950 and Sleepers in Seattle in 1993, helping both Cary Grant and Tom Hanks to find the woman of their dreams. He was also blown up by aliens in 1996's Independence Day and fares little better in other disaster movies. Soon after it opened, the Empire State Building was being lauded as the eighth wonder of the world and has received plaudits for not only its immense size, but its design as well. It is ranked very highly on lists of best and favourite buildings in America ever since it opened, including lists of modern engineering marvels and pictures taken on the frames of ironworkers are some of the most famous photographs ever. Ever taken. In short, almost everyone has been talking about the Empire State Building ever since it opened, which is exactly what the owners had hoped for. 
All the glamour and the publicity couldn't disguise the fact the Empire State Building was quickly turning into something of a financial disaster. So even before construction began, the stock market had crashed and the building was finished just as the worst of the Great Depression set in. Most of the workers who put up the building found themselves unemployed almost immediately after it finished as the construction industry in New York all but collapsed in the wake of the economic crisis. The Empire State, at its core, was an office building and its primary means of making money was renting out space to businesses and opening more than 2 million square feet of office space into a market that was already oversaturated as a result of the building boom in an environment where businesses were closing up shop, not opening up new offices, was never going to go well. And in fact, when the building opened, just 20% of the rentable space had been leased and half the elevators were even in operation because they only went to floors where literally nothing was happening. Witty commentators of the time referred to it as the empty space building. Ho, 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 ho. And not even the mooring mast on the top worked the way it was supposed to. Two attempts were made to dock with the building by airship, and when it didn't work, the whole project was abandoned as a wash. As it turns out, dirigibles as a concept were doomed to failure as well, which probably is a good thing for the Empire State Building, and one can only shudder at the thought of the carnage that the Hindenburg disaster taking place in the skies of New York City instead of rural New Jersey would have wrought. By the end of the 1930s, the building was bankrupt in all but name. The only reason MetLife didn't foreclose on the property was because they didn't want to be stuck managing it. It wouldn't be until the beginning of World War II that the economy of the country would recover and the Empire State Building would finally begin to live up to its lofty promise. But the building wouldn't come out of the war unscathed. And on July 28, 1945, a B-25 military aircraft lost in a unseasonably thick fog crashed into the 78th and 79th floors, instantly killing the three men on board as well as 11 office workers. The crash punched a huge hole in the building, snapping elevator cables and sending aircraft parts and debris plummeting to the streets below. Images of the disaster, which caused an estimated $1 million worth of damage to the building, but it did not compromise its structural integrity, bear a chilling similarity to another disaster that will strike the city 56 years later on September 11th. The Empire State Building would lose its status as the world's tallest building in 1970 when it was surpassed by the North Tower of the World Trade Center. By then, both Al Smith and John Raskob were long dead, and the building's new owners had waged a bitter campaign against the construction of the Twin Towers, claiming that they were unnecessary and would cost the Empire State business. Which, okay, but that's business. While some claimed it was nothing more than spite caused by losing out on the tallest building title, the building did lose at least some business to the World Trade Centers. Almost all of the TV stations that were using the 200 foot tall antenna attached to the mooring mast in 1951 switched to the taller building, costing the Empire State almost a million dollars a year in leasing fees. So the building underwent a number of modernizations and renovation initiatives beginning in the 1960s, such as installing air conditioning, making the observation deck wheelchair accessible, and replacing the original elevator with new ones that had the latest safety features. Their needs became quite apparent following a citywide power blackout in 1965 in which many people were trapped in elevators for hours and the fire department had to come and rescue them. One of the most prominent changes though was the installation of floodlights on the exterior of the upper floors in 1964 which were replaced with colour lighting in 1976 during the bicentennial celebration. And since then the building has been lit up in a number of different colours to celebrate things like holiday, sports team wins and then in November 7th 2023 to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the movie Elf. Perhaps one of the unfortunate downsides of the building being such an icon is that it's a popular place for people to commit suicide from. More than 30 people have jumped to their death since the building opened, prompting the building to install a barrier fence around the observation deck in 1947 to try and stop them. Perhaps one of the most famous jumpers from the building actually survived her attempt. In 1979, Elvita Adams jumped off the observation deck and would be blown back by a freak gust of wind onto um, the ledge of the floor below. Her only injury was a broken hip. And it's at this point I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the very harrowing statistic. Um, that is, almost every single respondent to a survey of people who survived suicide attempts when they jumped off of bridges or other um, high places reported that the first thing they felt when they jumped was regret. And there's a very poignant quote from uh, um, one such jump who said, uh, well, the first thing that struck me when I stepped off the edge um, is that every problem I had um, was solvable, except for the one that had just happened of stepping off a bridge to my death. And they very fortunately survived, so 
yeah, always look after yourself and your mental health. Moving away from that somber topic, not all the people who jumped off the building were trying to kill themselves. For example, in 1986, two men who had managed to sneak parachutes under their clothes successfully managed to base jump off the observation deck, landing safely on the street below. They both ended up getting arrested for their efforts because you just, you just can't do that. And by the 1990s, the Empire State Building is one of the most profitable properties in New York with a full roster of over a thousand tenants and over four million visitors per year. But it was also drawing attention for less savoury reasons. The building was at the centre of a hostile takeover led by the then real estate mogul Donald Trump. That dragged on in the courts until 2002. And in 1987, the observation deck was rocked by a tragedy when a 69-year-old man, Ali Hassan Abu Kamal, smuggled a handgun into the building used to shoot seven people, killing a Danish tourist, before turning the gun upon himself. As the Empire State Building approached its centennial, it has undergone more renovations to keep it relevant and fresh far into the future. A particular concern was making the building more energy efficient, saving millions of dollars a year in heating and cooling costs, as well as redesigning the lobby to streamline the parade of visitors that continue to flock to the building each and every day of the year, including Christmas Day. One thing that will probably never return, however, is the height record. So after the Twin Towers were destroyed on 9-11, the Empire State Building was once again New York's tallest building title it would hold until 2012 when the new One World Trade Center was finished. However, the title of World's Tallest hasn't belonged to a US building since 1998, and the current world record holder, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, is more than twice as tall as the Empire State. And in the 2010s, a renewed building boom, resulting in the creation of even taller towers that have since resigned the Empire State Building to the seventh tallest building, not in America, but in the city of New York. The loss of this record status though doesn't really seem to bother anyone involved with the Empire State Building because they've rebranded it as the world's most famous building instead. The Empire State was designated a New York City landmark in 1981 and added to the US National Register of Historic Places the very next year. It has remained popular with both tenants and with tourists and as a result is still immensely profitable for its owners, the Empire State Realty Trust, a corporation that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. The building's original owners had hoped that the Midtown site they selected to build on would become a new business district dotted with similar tall towers, like the financial districts at the southern tip of the island. And that didn't really pan out, but it did end up being to the building's benefit because it's not obscured by any other tall buildings. It can be seen all over New York City and is perhaps New York City's most distinctive landmark. It's a landmark that isn't really going anywhere anytime soon. According to structural engineers, the Empire State Building is as solid as the day it first opened. And there's every reason to believe that with the proper maintenance, it will continue to be structurally sound for centuries to come, perhaps even longer. And it is quite a fitting tribute to the men that designed and built the building, so legendary that we continue to marvel at it almost 100 years later. And I hope everybody at home found this video to be entertaining, educational and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things and you can give Ben Edelman a follow on social media below if you'd like to give them, like, you know, kudos for writing the script. Otherwise, uh, while you're down there, leave a like, a comment with feedback and suggestions and subscribe for more content like this. And as always, I'd like to wish everybody out there the day that they deserve. Cheers.